Movie House Cinemas, proud sponsors of Conversations with Jerry Kelly. Treat yourself to a movie. Relax in VIP recliner seating without the VIP price tag. At Cityside, Glen Gormley, Macara, and Coleraine. Enjoy the show. Good evening and welcome to Conversations with me, Jerry Kelly. My guest tonight will be very familiar to radio listeners both here and in the UK. Monday to Friday, he hosts the award-winning Talkback programme on Radio Ulster, and on Sundays you can hear him on Radio 4. To my mind, he is one of the most thought-provoking and knowledgeable journalists in broadcasting today. But just how much do we know about him? Let's welcome tonight's special guest, William Crawley. Thank you. William, this is a send out of an unusual setting for you, yes. being the interviewee rather than the interviewer. I hate it already, Jerry. Do you? No, I do. I hate it already. What do you hate about it? This is the only time I've ever done a chat show. I'm only doing it because it's you, because I know you, and um, please be gentle with me, but I just hate to be interviewed. I love to do interviews. I've done thousands of interviews, but I always say no to interviews, except when we've got a documentary out, and I have to do some press around it with a newspaper or something like that, but this really is news to me. Well, that sort of fits my opinion of you, because you're not your typical celebrity, radio, television celebrity. As in not a celebrity at all. As yeah. it, they're all true. Well, they're <laughs> a very well-known person, but you're, you're, you have a very private life, have you not? Oh, well, I mean, I, I look, I think if you, you have to make a decision when you're in the kind of work that we're in, you, are, if you can put your whole life out there and then some people will take advantage of that and go for you and attack you. Or you can make a, uh, a wall of separation in your life between your family, your relationships, your pet dog. I've got a lovely pet dog. I've never posted a picture of Jack anywhere on social media. I wouldn't even do that. So I keep a very close um, eye on my, my family and my personal life. And even with that, you get people who try to, to penetrate into that world, you know, because yeah. we're on social media now, you have lots of trolls, you have people who want to abuse you, want to go for you. Um, the police have been a, at our place really because some people tried to put my family's names and addresses on social media in order to target them, that kind of thing. So, I mean, th- you just got to be very careful, especially in the, wor- in the work that I do, because some people think they know what you think, yeah. think they know where you're yeah. coming yeah, from. Yeah. They often misunderstand me yeah. completely. Yeah. On social media, I get called everything. And on the same threads, I'm called contradictory things. But, you know, it's, it's water off a duck's back for me. But if it comes close to my family, then I have to be very protective. Fair comment, fair comment. Can we talk a little bit about your family without being too interested? Yeah, of course. Tell me about your early upbringing. My early upbringing, uh, you're, you're, which is the only upbringing I had, <laughs> uh, but uh, I grew up in North Belfast on the Shore Road and also in Mount Vernon, which was a heavily paramilitarized sort of UVF dominated estate in uh, North Belfast. Um, my mom was a cleaner. My dad drove a forklift truck. Um, I'm one of seven children. I'm the you're youngest. The youngest? I'm yeah. the youngest of seven. It was a difficult enough childhood. Grew up during the Troubles. Went to school with um, some people who are still in prison, uh, people who, who made their way into paramilitarism from the world I'm from. And it was difficult also because my father had alcoholic problems and uh, there were some very distressing dimensions of that for my mother, for my family. Uh, were you aware of your father's problem? Always. But being the youngest, were you, yes. were you shielded from the worst of it all? Yeah, because I was the youngest. He died when I was 16. But I didn't grieve his death until about 20 years afterwards. And even then, I think I was grieving the father I hoped I would have had rather than the one that I, what, I did have. What was your relationship with? Uh, practically non-existent. Really? Um, he was quiet um, when he came home from work, read the newspaper, went to bed quite early, would keep a hammer under the bed and hammer the floor if there was noise downstairs. Um, but also at the weekends, he, he, he was just drunk all the time at the weekends and he could get violent. He would get uh, aggressive and abusive. My, my brothers, because they were older than me, they saw more of that because I was younger. 
but I was constantly aware that I was, as I got older, I was getting closer to it. And then he got cancer and they told him he had about four weeks to, to live. And well, in fact, they didn't, they told my mother that she shielded him from that information because she always said he wouldn't want to know. Yeah. And the only time I remember holding his hand or touching him was on his deathbed. Wow. And years later, you changed your opinion? Years later, changed. I was making a TV documentary about death and dying. I, I, did, I did a trilogy of sort of autobiographical, um, sort of semi-autobiographical TV documentaries where we'd look at various aspects of, of life, death, alcohol, religion, the three main big ones in Ireland, right? Death, alcohol, and religion. And I visited my father's grave, which is up in Roselawn, he was cremated, sort of tree and his name was there. It was the first time I'd been there since uh, since his death. Did you feel guilty? I didn't feel guilty. How did you feel? Distant. Still, felt, uh, still alienated. Wondered who he was, wondered who he could have been. He had joined the army in the 1950s, you know, that post-war generation. They would go off to Egypt or some other part of the, the British Empire as it then was. And I think that was a brutalizing experience for a lot of those young men. Yeah. I mean, my mother always said that she married, she got to know him, dated him, and then very quickly he was off. And then he came back years later and he was a different person, completely different person. And I, I feel for her because she lived with, with that throughout her life. Um, and at a, at a time here when the idea of getting divorced or leaving was not, really on the horizon for some people mm. or a lot of people. And then when it came onto the horizon, um, he got the cancer and she gave up her job and took care of him and cared for him incredibly uh, for the last four weeks of his life. And she only, I mean, I'm saying this, I think my mother only really began to live her life after, after that. Yeah. And she lived a good life and she found love and she found happiness which I'm delighted for her. And then she died when I was 30. So I've lost both of them. But uh, there's hardly a day goes past me when I don't think of my mother, certainly every other day. And my father, it's a disruptive experience to, to think of him. Surprisingly, considering your academic achievements today, you didn't pass your 11 plus. I failed my 11 plus, yes. <laughs> I'm a very proud failure of the 11 Which plus. meant there for the grammar school education. I didn't you could, go to you, grammar school. You couldn't get a, have access to it. No, I went to grammar school when I was 16 to do A-levels, went to BRA for A-levels. Um, How I did you get to, in there? Because you were done Lambert school. Because I was in the Lambert, which was a single sex. So was it a natural school. progression that you were going? No, no. I met somebody from Dun Lambert who'd done precisely that, who had gone to that school and then and I didn't even know you could do this because I knew nothing. Um, and he said, you know, I'm, I went to uh, BRA because if you get some O-levels as they were back then, you know, you could talk your way in and then do some A-levels. And then he went to Queens and did aeronautical engineering and then went off from there and taught a public school in England, a science and mathematics teacher at a public school in England, somebody who came the, from North Belfast and, uh, and is still teaching there actually to this day. So I decided to do that. So what I did was... Um, we had this amazing teacher called Mr. Kennedy who taught the kids how to make phone calls, how to write applications for jobs, how to present yourself, how to speak clearly so that you had a bit of authority when you were addressing someone. So I phoned up BRA and the secretary thought I was a parent, didn't realize I was this sort of mid 16 precocious she thought, <laughs> she thought I was a parent trying to get through to make a complaint to the headmaster she put me straight through to Mr. Sillery the headmaster and then when he when he started talking he said hi you're, you're a pupil are you a pupil somewhere <laughs> and then I, I made the pitch and he said listen if you get and he gave me the bare minimum he actually he clearly was impressed with that for the phone call that he gave me the bare minimum required for O levels to get into A levels and if you get those give me a call will take you in. And he was as oh, good as his word. Well, that was the making stuff. He was not pretty good from there. Yeah. And there you went on the yeah. games. You studied philosophy at Queen's? Well, I went from a secondary school where there was no assumption that you would even do A-levels. In fact, you couldn't do it yeah. in yeah. Lambert. Uh, to a grammar school where there was an assumption that everybody was going to university. The only question was, which one are you going to? 
I was the only one in my family who had done A-levels, let alone go to university. So I went there and it completely changed my attitude to life because I walked into this new world of a different kind of assumption. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I fell for philosophy, um, so much so that when I was at BRA, I, I started up a philosophy society in the school. And then I did philosophy at Queen's and I, I did a doctorate in philosophy as well. Yeah. And, and then I went to Princeton Seminary in, in America for three years. Well, where did that. you find religion? Let's talk about Princeton. Finding religion. Well, well, that's one of my trilogy of documentaries of how I find religion. Because when I was 16, I was taken by my sister and her husband to one of these big evangelical tent missions that used to be really common actually during the troubles yeah, yeah, yeah. we used to have americans and canadians you remember this who would come here during the troubles i think they thought they were being helpful and they would build big tents somewhere and then people would come and you get the american style preacher and people would walk up the middle of the aisle and pledge their life to god and music would be playing in the background It'd be very emotional so i did all that and and then in the documentary the producers found this guy who had come to Northern Ireland. He's called Barry Moore. They found him. He was a Canadian. And they brought him back. And they put a tent up. And they recreated the experience with real people who wanted to be there. And afterwards, I had this really awkward on-screen encounter, on -screen encounter with him. Because I said to him, because he said, you know, I'm your father in the Lord. You know, that sort of thing. And I said, the, dif the difference is... I have moved on so much in my life from the person at 16 who walked up that aisle at the sound of your voice. I have moved on so far, but you haven't changed at all. He hadn't changed it. He said, why would I change any of my views? Well, where did you move on to? Well, and what changed? I mean, well, well, you have to understand, I think, why I walked up the aisle in the first place. Because this guy stood up there talking about God as an incredible father and church as an amazing family and eternity and the clarity and the sense and the importance of all of that. And at this point in my life, I, I was looking for a father. I was looking for stability in a family. I was looking for something that made sense. You might say, why didn't I walk up the aisle? Of course I was going to walk up the aisle. I feel now it was kind of, um, there was an emotional pathway there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but eventually, and I became a minister eventually, yeah. um, in the Presbyterian church and that, and I f came to know a, an experience of family of that kind, really in the church. Yeah. But you became a minister, which means that you're heavily into religion. You're heavily into God mm -hmm. and what God stands for. Yeah. That usually goes with it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah usually goes one, <laughs> one, goes one, one, well, not always. <laughs> in my case it did. Yes. So where, where was your ministry? Well, as I said, I trained in America. I went to America and I studied there for three years. And then I was a, uh, an assistant minister in a church in New York, um, First Presbyterian Church on Fifth Avenue in New York, uh, which is in Greenwich Village, which is a big liberal, gay, out there kind of progressive world. And then I came back to this place and became a chaplain at the University of Ulster for four years. I mean, I was a, an assistant minister in a church in Belfast as well for a couple of years. But I had been teaching philosophy and theology before I went to America. And when I came back, I continued teaching philosophy and theology at both Queen's and uh, the Belfast Bible College and other places. And then um, after, I suppose, a couple of years, three, four years, the BBC came into my life. Before we get to the BBC... Did you think during that period when you were here that this is going to be my life, a life dedicated to God? I, th I definitely thought that when I was training for the ministry, and I definitely thought that when I was ministering, and I, I think I became increasingly um, out of place, really, in Northern Ireland. Disillusioned? Um, yes, but also out of place, like a fish out of water. Why? Right within um, religion here, because Why? the religion I'd come to know was really progressive and uh, adventurous. And then I came back and find during the Troubles, there was only one real story in time when it comes to religion, and that was whether Catholics and Protestants would worship, and you know what about the IRA and the UVF and all those kinds of things, the ecumenical questions. 
other parts of the world had dealt with those questions decades earlier. But the other issues that the rest of the world had moved on to, big social and moral issues, we didn't deal with them here because we were frozen by the troubles. We were dealing only with that yes. stuff yes. that was going on here. When the troubles went away, then those issues hit Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland um, really in the face. And, and you've seen since then, both North and South, societies that are grappling with those other issues now and are it's always catching up with other parts of europe other parts of the world in the republic will do it with referenda and that kind of thing here people fight over the issues in the assembly when we had one or they'll fight about it on the on the radio shows or the in the newspapers whatever um or you might change the law in parliament but we're making um a journey into a new kind of understanding of the world and when i came back from america i was plunged really back into a world that i had kind of moved away from yes were you ever tempted to stay in america yeah i had an opportunity to stay in america um and i could have stayed and i i loved the church i was in i absolutely adored it but my mother by that point was diagnosed with cancer okay. so i came back and i wanted and i knew she had a year left and i wanted to spend her last year with her living in her home with her where does religion fit in your life now? Because I read somewhere that you describe yourself as a lapsed Protestant. A <laughs> lapsed Protestant, yeah. I did that at a book launch once yeah. for somebody and it's haunted me ever since because it was meant to be a joke at the time. But I think <laughs> someone put it into a Wikipedia profile and it's haunted me ever since. Um, or what, so I, am, I, I don't think that there are many more important issues in the world than making sense of the world. And whether that's making political sense of the world or making sense of the world in religious terms and they often go together i mean religion for since 9 11 at the very least um has been a front page story it hasn't been a kind of page 17 the religion page kind of story it's been front and center look at what's happening in israel and gaza right now i mean religion is part of that story it's not all of the story Religion was part of the story of Northern Ireland. Not all of the story. It's also a constitutional dispute. There's ethnicity. There's all kinds of things involved. Which would lead you to believe, therefore, that, that religion is divisive rather than unifying. Well, it can be divisive and it can be unified. So, I mean, take the example of um, slavery in the United States. There were uh, preachers and churches who defended slavery. The Catholic Church defended slavery historically. Protestant churches defended church, uh, slavery historically. Southern Baptist in America defending slavery in that period of time. All those churches had to make progress beyond that, didn't they? They had to morally evolve beyond all of that. But when you look at those who were enslaved, those enslaved human beings, and the the spirituals that they sta they started to sing that were liberation songs for them, these were spirituals that were rooted in the Bible. They were rooted in the story of Exodus, the people of God being released from Exodus, from their slavery into a new land. So there's a great irony here that the slave owners not only took their bodies, but they gave them Bibles. They, and when they got their hand on those bi hands on those Bibles, they started to read stories of liberation and then said, no, this is my story. So you go to a black American church today and you're going to get a biblical liberationist message. So I would say that's true of most religions, wouldn't you? That you, you've got the potential for slavery, for the defense of genocide, for the defense of spiritual abuse, it's all there. The world. But you also have the potential for liberation mm -hmm. in those texts. And it all depends who's doing the reading. The Bible in the hands of someone who wants to do great evil in the world is an incredibly dangerous, dangerous book. But in the hands of someone like Martin Luther King, who wants to do something other than great evil in the world, it can be a liberating text. Are you still a churchgoer? No. No? No, I'm not. I haven't been a churchgoer for a long time. Um, okay, I, how do you square that? Well, there's no squaring to be done because I reflect on religion and theology and the place of God in the world for people and how people see God in their different ways. And I try to understand how that affects politics, society, morality, and uh, how people engage with other people who see God in different ways or tell God's stories. Do you find that a former Presbyterian minister doesn't go to church anymore? Uh, that's why you're called former. Yes, but it does seem some road to Damascus. Well, no, I think it's a sign. I mean, if you don't change your mind, it's a probably a sign that you don't have one, right? Okay. 
you're allowed okay. to change your mind yeah. about all kinds of things. But it's something that you trained for. Some, well, I mean, there, committed your life to. There are indeed. I mean, there are people. I, one one thing, Jerry, I discovered about myself is I'm not a joiner. I discovered this about myself quite a long time ago. I'm not. I don't want other people to tell me how to think. I don't want other people to tell me the rules say you must do this. I don't want other people to tell me your identity is. Um, shaped by your relationship with us. I want to make my own way of the world. I what want to is answer. Your, what is your identity I want today? to answer all of those questions. Have I asked you so, what you are today? What's I, your answer? I, I, it's too complicated a question to answer, isn't it? Because I'm a hundred things, and you're a hundred things. You're not one thing, are you? No. Why today? would you want to be? Why would you want to be one thing? And also, I'm not the person I was, uh, you know, ten minutes ago. I'm not the person I was. Um, 10 years ago or 20 years ago that's 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 what identity is not a fixed binary in life we are constantly evolving in our reception of the world and our engagement with the world so who i am today is not who i was when i was 16 and that's as it should be yeah i wish i had studied for lot. <laughs> you still can <laughs> don't get on with it yeah how did you get to the bbc how did you get where you are today within the bbc what well what happened Oh, this is going to confuse you even more. Um, I was asked to do Thought for the Day. When you were a minister? Yeah. So the, you know, Thought for the Day, for people who don't know, is a short um, kind of message on the radio. And uh, so I was invited to do Thought for the Day. And I did Thought for the Day. Um, for what you've seen out there? Yes. Yep. And I enjoyed it. I did a whole bunch of it. I did it from Radio 2, Radio 4's Prayer for the Day. I did all kinds of stuff like that. And and then there was an opportunity to present a program called Sunday Sequence on yes. Sunday mornings. Yes. And they gave me an opportunity to try it out. And uh, they gave me a test run, which wasn't broadcast. And it seemed to work out all right. And they said, we'll give, you a, we'll give you a few months and see how it goes. And I ended up doing 12 years on yeah. that. And I was still a chaplain at the university. I was still teaching philosophy and theology at the time while doing that. So I had a very busy week. I mean, I, I was nonstop. I didn't have a weekend at all for those uh, co first couple of years. And then in 2004... Fork in the road, uh, had an opportunity to go back to America or to stay here. And I knew if I was going to stay within churches, that the the world that I was in in America would probably be the more comfortable yeah. one for me. Yeah. But if I was going to stay here, it would probably not involve churches. And then the BBC heard about this moral dilemma, and they said to me, "Well, why don't we make you an offer, and we'll 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 develop a." A contract where you do radio and television and digital and all kinds of stuff and so that's what i i finally it took me one month to decide this but i finally decided to do that and day one of working for the bbc they put me on i was on a plane and i flew to the subarctic church on manitoba and i had to wear seven layers of clothing and we landed on ice and i was out skidooing amongst polar bears and we made a TV documentary called Frozen North about climate change and about the possible implications. This is 2004. And of course, you know, it's not exactly prophetic in 2004, but it's out of date okay. now, let's just say, because things have gotten an awful lot worse. Uh, and then I met other documentaries. I've flown all around the world doing documentary TV series, coast to coast, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, all kinds of places. I think I've probably made about 40 TV documentaries with the BBC yeah. in that yeah. period of time. And they also allowed me to develop radio, not just Sunday Sequence, but other kinds of things, Radio 4, Radio 3 documentaries and, and stuff like that. And the best part of it all for me was I discovered this is perfect for the kind of mind that I have. Cause you're happy. What is it? Because it is, yeah. Well, listen, yeah. listening to talk back every day, you're dealing with that same old story. There's still the Protestant and Catholic thing. Nah. They, oh, there you is. need a list more often. No, there is. When you date. Do you not get sick of it after no. now? Do I'll you not feel like, what, what are you talking? Could you not really yeah. use that and say, what are you talking about? No, I mean, on Talk Back today, I did a 30-minute interview with Clint Hill, who's the only surviving U.S. Secret Service agent uh, from JFK's okay. assassination. I'd love that. The guy who climbed on top of the car and tried to block the bullet. Would love to talk and to somebody. The, working for the BBC has given me access to. He's ninety-one now, incidentally. He's an extraordinary man, but gives me access to that. I've I've interviewed um, in the Irish Nocturne three Irish presidents, at least six or seven Tishi, uh, three prime ministers, uh, King Hassan of Jordan, 
uh, probably 20 or 30 Nobel Prize winners, um, professors galore, writers galore, Booker Prize winners, every kind of person. So I, I don't have the kind of career which is just talking to one person or one type of person. And I'm incredibly privileged, Jerry, by that, because I couldn't have done that myself. It was working for a company that opens doors to those kinds of encounters that's, that's been my life. You're happy with your life at the moment? I am, yeah. I am. I mean, obviously, I want to do more. There's always something new to do. Well, there's really 24 hours in the day. There, uh, that's true. I've, I've pushed it, but that's true. What would the ambition be? What is, is there something you would love to do that you haven't done? Yeah. What? Yeah. I'd love to do a chat show. <laughs> no, I don't I'd love to do a chat show. What kind of chat show? Well, do you remember Dick Cavett? I do. Dick Cavett was a great chat show host in America. Back in the, what, 60s, 60s and the 70s, yeah. right? I was kind of, and I, you can watch all this stuff on YouTube. Obviously, I wasn't watching it back then. But it was, this is the kind of show that doesn't get made anymore, right? Because the comedians essentially have taken over right. the chat shows, right. which is great. We all love a comedian in the chat show. But Dick Cavett would have Orson Welles sitting there with a writer and an actor or whatever, or mix it all up, and they would have on television an actual conversation. An actual real people would encounter each other. He'd sit back and he let some of this happen. And I mean that that to me is fabulous. But it don't you think that's kind of gone? In that, the world? Oh, it's totally it's gone. It's it yeah. totally yeah. gone. Yeah, there's nobody interested in that anymore. I am. Television moguls are not interested. They're not in that interested, that interested because uh, you've got to have somebody on there with a book to sell or a, well a TV show to sell. Yeah. And it's it's that's just the way it's going nowadays. And of course, terrestrial television is coming to its end. Well, it is, and terrestrial radio as well, in some ways, and podcasts are out there now, and people are on YouTube. People are doing their own thing, and what do you notice? What do you notice? Human beings are gravitating towards those kinds of conversations on podcasts, YouTubes, and everywhere else. But the public is becoming the producer, the director, the presenter, and they're doing it. And they watch and listen to what and they they'll want to listen. And people are making millions out of it, making a fortune in some cases. Well, I'll tell you what, when you, you and I, we need a podcast. We need a podcast. Yeah. And if it's not a podcast, they'll all be listening to talk back. <laughs> William, it's a great privilege. Thank you for sharing uh, part of your life with us. Pleasure. There's so much more that we could have talked about, but but we we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. William Crowley, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>